Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and today I'm joined by my friends and colleagues, Laura Davidson and Justin Bowler. And we're going to be talking about how to maximize your gig rig, some tips and tricks to be ready to rock. <laughs> But before we get into that, just a few things to note. Um, first of all, as you can probably tell from our webcams, we are all coming to you live from our homes. We are still working remotely at Sure, um, And so uh, it's not our usual controlled environment. So if we run into any sort of audio or connectivity issues, please just be patient. Bear with us. We'll try to get through those as best as we can. Um, but we think it's too important to get this information out to you. So... Just bear with us. Um, second of all, the session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, when it's available, it will be viewable at sure.com slash webinars. Just give us a couple days because it usually takes us a few days to make sure that the audio and the video are edited and looking and sounding good for you. Um, and sure.com webinars, sure.com slash webinars is where you can go to see all of our past archived webinars. And it's also where you can go to see all of our future upcoming webinars. So please feel free to go there. Check them all out. Watch some on-demand webinars. You'll learn a lot. Um, and then lastly, <laughs> as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those in the question pane. If you do not see a question pane um, and you are logged in through the web application, look for a little circle with a question mark and click on that. That's where you can enter your questions in. Um, or if you're joined through the GoToWebinar app, um, look for sort of a, on your desktop, look for a dark gray toolbar with an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that white arrow and that will give you access to the question pane. Ask any questions that you have as we go through but please note that we will be holding on those until the end of the session. So type in those questions, be patient, and we'll get to them at the end. All right. Without further ado, let's get into the good stuff. Take it away, Laura and Justin. Thanks, Cheryl. And hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is going to be it's going to be a fun webinar because normally we do a lot of really technical things. And this one's more of a conversation um, where we're just going to talk about some of our experiences we've had, um, you know, doing a million gigs and, and what that looks like and things to consider when you're bringing them on the road and or just doing a little coffee house gig. So I know a lot of us aren't gigging right now. And the reason why we want to talk about it is that now is a great time to check your rig, make sure all the pieces are in working order. If not, order some up. So maybe this will start some new ideas for you. But the first thing we want to do is tell you who the heck we are. So you know why we're talking at you for the next little while. So I'm Laura Davidson, and I head up market development for our retail team, which basically means I get to go out and teach people about the brand um, and show people new ways to use our gear. And Justin, introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Justin Bowler. I'm a senior applications engineer and the applications engineering department. That's kind of our tech support here at Sure, so we can help you choose and use your Sure products, answer any questions, maybe research vintage products, whatever you need. Uh, we're here and we'll try to help you with that. And I'll just interject there. If you ever want to reach out to anybody on that team, you can always go to sure.com slash contact. Um, and there's a handy dandy form you can fill out and open up a ticket with them. And they are super smart and can answer almost any audio question you've got. And if they can't, they'll probably figure it out. So sure.com slash contact. Sorry. Very true. And Cheryl, you should say what you do. We never get to introduce you, and you're going to be talking too. <laughs> that what is, do you do for us? That is true. Um, I am a <laughs> digital marketing specialist. Um, I primarily focus on uh, social media and um, things like that. So, And I host webinars, which is one of my favorite things to do. So, <laughs> Yes, we would be sunk without Cheryl. Seriously, these things are crazy, and they definitely involve some teamwork. So, All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, the agenda, and this is going to be just, again, kind of more of a discussion, is just to go over kind of some of the helpful gear terminology if you're not familiar with some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, then start by determining your needs. Is it uh, a coffee house? Is it a church gig? Are you playing Carnegie Hall? Like, let's talk about all the variables there. Uh, and then a checklist. We're actually going to put together a checklist, and this will have just kind of a bare bones starting point for you, um, some building blocks. And then a little bit about gathering that gear once you've made your checklist and additional tips like what to do at the end of the gig and some other fun things. So that's the basic idea of what we're going to be talking about. So let's jump into um, some of the terminology that we're going to be mentioning. So uh, and if you want to put into your comment window, you know, what you do as a musician, that'd be great. Normally we put out a poll, but, um, you know, just let us know kind of the gigs that you're you're doing typically. Uh, but we're just going to talk about basic building blocks. So the PA is a term that gets thrown around a lot. And it's it's short for public address system. But 
basically the, the components are that you have your inputs, your volume and a gain control, an amplifier to get you heard and loudspeakers to be physically heard. So there's a lot of different shapes and sizes that these come in. Um, the one that you see on the left is more of a robust system that you could use out and about. And this would have your mixing board, several microphones, um, and the mixing board would have several inputs, uh, your loudspeakers for the audience to hear you, and then your wedges so that you could hear yourself. But you might just be you know, a performer like I am, a solo performer, and something like a Fender Passport would be really handy, or one of the more self-contained PA systems where it folds up into a nice little package and you can roll it away because my main thing when I'm getting my gig rig ready is that it's compact and easy to schlep because I'm the one schlepping it on my own uh, roadie. So just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what a PA system includes when you hear that term kind of thrown around. Justin, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I would, I would just add to that that, you know, these days, something that's been a, becoming a lot more common is just the powered PA speaker. So it looks like one of the speakers on the stands in the picture on the left, maybe, but it, it, it integrates the power amplifier you may have one or two or more mixer input channels on it. And those could be mic level or line level. So, uh, you know, they even have RCA inputs for your backing tracks, your iPod between sets, whatever it is. And, um, you know, that can be pretty versatile. It can also limit you in some cases. So if you're trying to plug in more than one or two mics, maybe you do need a separate mixer to get more inputs on that. But we can get into that a little bit later. Um, that's mm -hmm. very convenient though, because you can get these with an eight inch woofer, a 10 inch woofer, a 12 inch, um, you know, it's pretty scalable. So if you just need, um, a single PA speaker for, you know, singer songwriter gig or a small ensemble versus something like on the left where you've got, you know, it looks like 12 inputs on that mixer, or 16 inputs, monitor wedges, speaker stands, subs, all that stuff, you know, it's, um, pretty scalable from the most basic thing up to, you know, even like an installed sort of a concert rig with line arrays. So we're kind of talking about everything in between here. <laughs> but yeah, but the basic components are there. Basically, it's the way the audience can hear you. So it's a way of plugging in what you're playing so they can be amplified and heard by the crowd. Um, so it can be anything from a single speaker, like Justin was saying. I have one of those where you can just plug everything into the speaker and take that with you or something a little bit more robust so that other people can plug in or multiple channels and instruments, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, something to think about when you are gigging, do you need to bring a PA or do they have one? So we'll get to that in a little while as well. So next up in our list of things uh, is uh, monitors. So when you're playing out live, especially if you're playing in a larger venue and even in a smaller one, it's important that you're able to hear yourself so that you don't have any sort of ear strain. Um, if you're anything like me, you didn't play with monitors, far too often when you were younger and now you're regretting it. So uh, there's a couple of different types we wanted to talk about, one being stage monitors. So in that previous picture and slide, you saw the floor wedges. So those are monitors that would sit on the stage, point at you so that you can hear yourself. And But what we do at Shure and a lot of other companies do is make something called in-ear monitors, which allow you to monitor your sound in real time so that you're able to control your mix. And that's really key because everybody in the band can have their own independent mix and not have to say, you know, turn the drums down in the wedge and then the drummer suffers. So just two different form factors. Obviously stage monitors are gonna be heavier, <laughs> more pieces to carry. Uh, In-ears are lighter, but then you also have to deal with uh, some frequency coordinations. Justin, why don't you tell a little bit about IEMs for the the people. Sure. Yeah. And there's uh, many advantages to the IEMs. Uh, one that you already mentioned was that, you know, they're a lot lighter and easier to carry around than a bunch of wedges, you know, especially if they have power amplifiers built in, those things can weigh a ton and take hmm. up a lot of space in your car, your van, your trailer. Um, they're also very loud. So using an in-ear monitor system, it kind of helps you control the stage volume. You don't have to turn your mics up as loud. Maybe uh, you don't deal with as many feedback issues from the monitors. You're not confined to standing in one spot on stage right in front of that wedge speaker just to be able to hear yourself in your band. So it gives you freedom of movement. Um, it also lets you, um, and uh, you know, I think uh, Cheryl might be able to comment on her rig. You know, she's got a traveling, you know, portable rat case, and all the in-ear monitors are there. And every time you get it out and plug it in, it's the same thing. So you don't have to sit there and set it up every time you use it. That's another really big advantage. 
And then to Laura's point, it also can help protect your hearing because you know, rather than standing in front of this monitor speaker blasting at you, you're wearing an earphone that also works kind of like an earplug. So you're reducing the uh, potential damage to your ears. Um, so a lot of good advantages to that. Uh, the limiting factors, of course, are uh, you know, your mixing board, your sound system. You know, you might not have the luxury of you know, giving every band member their own mix. You know, everybody might have to share the same mix. Um, and you know, again, that depends on how many inputs and outputs the mixing board has, and also how many in-ear monitor systems you're running. And that brings us to the frequency question, which you know you do mm -hmm. have to coordinate those wireless frequencies with any of your wireless microphones, your guitar wireless systems, and however many in-ear transmitters you have. That might change from place to place if you're traveling to different cities. So um, you know, frequency coordination does become a factor. And that also might limit you in some venues. You know, if there's a lot of other wireless channels, maybe you can't get those six stereo in-ear mixes that you're used to. You have to come up with another plan and scale things down for that show. Uh, one other thing is, um, you know, not all of the in-ear monitor systems are wireless. I know there's a lot of um, wired monitor systems like the Avioms that are pretty popular. And those kind of give you a personal mix there. This might be more of in like a house of worship band where you're standing in one place. But if you need more drums or less bass or more of the singer, then you just go on your uh, personal mixer and dial that in. So that's kind of another uh, form factor for in-ear monitors. Yeah, that's a great one. I forgot about that. So... Yeah, you can have that ability without being wireless. But the one you're seeing in the picture is the Shure PSM 300 system, which is a great system, um, really affordable and really simple to use. Uh, and it makes your life easier and makes your music sound better. So get you some. Uh, so next thing, oh, sorry, go ahead. Justin. Real quickly, a question we get a lot is, you know, can you add more than one receiver pack to this monitor yeah. system? And what you're Good seeing question. in the picture is a single transmitter and two receiver packs. Those can be configured to hear the same thing and it's just like tuning into a radio station so if you need 10 packs or 20 packs that's fine as long as everybody's hearing the same thing mm -hmm. to give everybody their own mix you have to start adding more transmitter channels as well and you know go back to the uh um, the mixer being a limited factor you know how many sends do you have on your mixer that accommodate this or is everybody just hearing the same stereo mix from the mixer I'm, uh, so yeah, I'll add on the PSM 300 um, and any stereo monitoring system, um, a really interesting, cool little workaround you can do. And the reason kind of part of the reason why we sell that twin pack that you're seeing there is that with a stereo system, you can use um, with at least with the sure was one. I'm not sure ones. I'm not sure about others. You can use sort of a, um, a dual channel mix mode. Um, so if you're OK with monitoring in mono, what you can do is you can put one channel into one side and another channel into the other. And then each body pack pan to either side hard left or hard right and it's kind of a way to get two channels out of one and once again then you're also kind of sharing the same frequency so one less one less frequency one less transmitter that you have to purchase a little bit of easy way to kind of streamline the setup and do it affordably with a little bit a little less channel count mm -hmm. yep all right so that's the monitor side of things next thing we wanted to mention is a di or a direct input and it's something that I think when I was gigging early on, I kind of tended to forget about. Um, I was using an Alvarez guitar with an aftermarket pickup in it, a Fishman pickup, and it needed a DEI, but I didn't know what that was because I, I was just starting to play the guitar. So then I'd go to gigs or writer's nights and I'd plug my guitar in thinking that it would be fine, but without the DEI to get it into the PA or the snake on the stage, uh, it couldn't power my guitar. So. That was, that was a frustrating thing to forget. And essentially what it's doing is taking that unbalanced high impedance signal, so your line level of your guitar, and converting it into a balanced mic level signal to plug directly into the mixer. So you can see in a little diagram there, which we took from Sweetwater, so thank you, Sweetwater, uh, to uh, get it into your PA. So just something to think about if you don't have a DI and you are playing an acoustic instrument, um, it's a great thing to have in your toolbox. Yeah, one of the advantages to that too is that you know you're not going to get your guitar and a 50 foot patch cable and plug into the house system uh That's just a good convenient too. it's going to affect your tone and so what the di box does is it takes that signal as laura was saying it converts the high impedance signal from the guitar to a low impedance balanced signal you then can run that cable hundreds of feet back to the you know the soundboard at the other end of the room and um it basically just makes your guitar signal your keyboard signal look like a microphone signal according to the mixer. 
um, where, you know, another thing is that a lot of times they'll just have a snake box on stage or, you know, a box with a bunch of inputs for microphones. This allows you to plug other sources into that. And then the last thing I could point out on this picture here, um, if you kind of follow up to the big bass amp or guitar amp that this guy has in the, in the back there, um, this is actually passing the signal from the bass through the DI box into the amp and also into the PA system. So that takes care of your monitoring on stage. You can still hear yourself and then supply that bass signal to the sound engineer at front of house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just something that I think when you're first starting out, you might not think about, you might just think you'd show up and plug in and all will be fantastic, but um, definitely worth considering adding that to your rig. Okay, so those are the key terms we wanted to talk about. There's a million more we could, but those were just the ones that kind of floated to the surface. So what we wanted to talk about next is the needs. So figuring out where you're going to be playing, because that's going to determine what you bring. And Cheryl's going to chime in on this in a minute, because she does several different types of gigs with several different bands. Um, so that flows into the gear needs. So if you're playing in a band, who's bringing what? Because the last thing you want is to assume that Bob, the drummer, is going to bring, you know, the floor wedges, and then he didn't know. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're clearly outlining who's responsible for which gear, um, and just make sure that you always have a list. Uh, and then ahead of the gig, not an hour before the gig, but maybe like a day or two or a week before, because we have time right now, uh, gather your gear, make sure nothing's broken, um, you know, then you'll be reminded that at the gig last time you broke three strings or whatever, so you might need to restring your guitar. Uh, so just check the gear and gather it all in one spot so you can see and take stock and inventory, make sure it's ready to rock. And then the extras, what are you going to need to bring to the gig? Is it a hot day? Um, are you going to be on a super slippery stage where you need a rug or gaff tape to tape down your cables so you're not tripping all over everything and bring that anyway because it's going to be good. Uh, but just things that we tend to forget about until we're there. Um, and, you know, I think I forgot to put a capo on here, too, which we'll get to on the checklist. But that's one that I've forgotten a lot. So, <laughs> Cheryl, talk about uh, talk about some of your rigs and how you've determined how to get them ready. Right. All right. So um, I perform in a couple of different bands of, of different sizes and different scopes. Um, and so what I kind of do is I have like a modular system. Um, so I like to kind of keep all the various components like one band I have to bring um, some some equipment for 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 running tracks and I run all the digital tracks for the band. Um, so that, of course, involves some specific cables and a specific DI and my laptop. Um, and so that all of those kinds of things, I have all of these I have these separate little clear plastic little zip up containers and I kind of have different components of different gig rigs in each of those. So I can take one and keep it with one thing. And then when I'm doing another band that say I don't need that, I don't need the tracks, I can leave that there. But that band, I need all the makeup and wig accessories. So that's in a different one. So I pull that one in. So um, it's kind of modular. I keep everything in a giant three tier Stanley rolling toolbox um, and it works really well for wow. me yeah it's it's nice but yeah it's, it's all about like defining what you need and kind of keeping it easy easy to grab so it's like okay yes for this gig i know i need this and this and this and i don't need this um and it, it helps keep me organized because there's a lot of things depending on which gig it is that i need that's awesome and maybe you know drop some questions or some comments into the chat too because i really want to know how you guys manage your gear too um you know for me i we're going to see it in a bit but i've repurposed old suitcases because they roll and they're not going anywhere anytime soon tsa wise so uh you know that's what i use them for all right I think so if we're preparing next for this i'm oh, sorry mm -hmm. you know no, Laura, you brought it. up a good point you know it doesn't have to be some really fancy you know ata rated flight case and shock mounted <laughs> and all that you know it can be the old suitcase or an old duffel bag or just you know i guess unless you're touring you know, make the right, investment yeah. if you're touring <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right but if it's just going in your trunk on the way to the gig you know i suppose even a plastic shopping bag will get the job done We've all been there. Attitude, right? yeah. But I, I will yeah. definitely reiterate, though, it's good to, you know, have something that is dedicated, whether it is a really nice flight case or just an old suitcase that you don't use for travel anymore. Because if you have that one centralized location where you can kind of keep everything, as long as you're not mm -hmm. having to take things out, you're going to be more likely to get everything you need to each gig if you kind of have it all centrally in one place. Right. And that's also important to say is that if you can have duplicate pieces of kit, you know, that's important. So like I have my studio over here 
And I've gotten to the point now where I don't have to pull cables off my studio for my live rig and vice versa. So not everybody can do that, but if you can duplicate your rig so that it's just grab and go and just maintaining the gig and the gear is what you need to do, that's that's kind of the ideal situation. But and I'll say, it wasn't always like that. <laughs> and I'll say with this current situation that we're in, my gig rig is a shambles because I keep grabbing things oh. from it that I need now that we're at yes. home and doing things at home that we would normally be doing at shows, like putting together video production and audio tracks to send out to people. So my gig exactly. rig, I'm not, I guess I'm kind of a bad example because kind of, mine's a mess right now. <laughs> when, I go, when I but go on that, when that's I, what happens. Then you, then you use your checklist here in a second. But um, yeah, before we get to that, Justin was going to tell us a little bit about this next slide because this is important. Okay. Something we all forget about, we're all guilty of if you've played out. So go for it, Justin. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you'll recognize the XLR and the quarter inch connectors here. And those are pretty common. I threw in a USB connector, RJ45 Ethernet connector, a 3.5 millimeter connector. I was joking around. I was going to put a picture of a garden hose on here um, just to throw <laughs> that in. And the point is, you know, if you've got a guitar and you forget your patch cable, you know, somebody else in the band might have one. Maybe the sound engineer will let you borrow one and roll his eyes at you. But if you have some kind of special need, um, you know, you've got your old uh, Casio SK-1 sampling keyboard that you use for one song, or you're miking a melodica, uh, if you need to plug in your I iPhone at some point and you don't have the right adapter cable, you know, you might get in a bad situation with that. So um, don't assume that the house or the sound engineer or the other guy in your band bringing the PA is going to have those cables and adapters. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of fits right along with this gig rig example. And um, actually, we mentioned Sweetwater earlier. My Sweetwater sales flyer had an article this month. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, kind of going over what people bring on the road with them. And I think the really, you know, the, the take home from that was whatever you need that's important, you should bring two of if you're on the road. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if it's going to fail at some point, you need to have a backup if it's that important. So, um, yeah, just, just whatever you need, you know, bring it with you. If, uh, if you're, um, doubtful about it being there, then bring your own. That also extends to the in-ear monitor systems we were talking about earlier. Um, some of those have XLR inputs. Some of them have quarter inch inputs. Maybe you'll get to a gig and the house PA only has quarter inch monitor sends. So what do you do there? Mm -hmm. You know, that's up to you to have those adapters or you might just have to get by without your in-ear monitors for that gig. So I just kind of wanted to drive that point home. I'll mm -hmm. add a nice. Yeah, that's important. I'll add a tip um, with having your having your own cables and your adapters and everything. Label them. Um, that's the yes. quickest and easiest thing to lose. So for me personally, I have a roll of hot pink duct tape that I keep in my gig rig <laughs> and, um, every cable that is mine is marked with hot pink duct tape. And that way I know at yeah. the end of the night, I'm going to get those cables back because XLRs aren't expensive, but when you need 10 of them, they start to, they start yes. to rack up. And you lose track. I use these little yellow mini zip ties and I just put them on there and then I know those are my cables. I just pulled them out of my gig bag when I was putting this picture together. That's how I happen to have a prop right here. But um, yeah, label your things. Label all your things. I have like my name on everything and my maiden name is Clap and it's still my musician name. So no one's taken that. <laughs> like, they, don't, they don't want it. So yeah, label everything you have. Something one of my bandmates used to do is, you know, every once in a while you'll get those free address labels, you know, from like oh, charities. Yeah. Those are a really great way to label your equipment because then you've got your address information on there as well, just in case it's a mm -hmm. important piece of gear you need back. Just make sure you donate to, donate to too, St. Yeah. Jude and Easter Seals. Okay, people, <laughs> yes. don't be stealing yes. those labels. Yeah. Of course, right. I, I thought that was implied, use right? The labels. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yes, those are, that's a great one. I used to do that. I forgot about that. All right, let's talk about the checklist now because this is kind of kind of what we came up with. And it's not it's not perfect or comprehensive in any way. It's just kind of meant to give you a, a starting point for any type of gig you're going to do. So things that you want to consider, power, PA, instrument mics, and miscellaneous. Those are your categories that we want to talk about. So the first one in, in all the categories is power. So you want to know and bring all the power uh, solutions that you might encounter out there in the world. Because how many gigs have you gotten to where you realize you have six wall warts that you need to plug in and you have no power strip or you have no extension cord and you're hoping the bar has it and they never do. So you got to bring your own. If you're going to be pro and you're going to be prepared, 
be prepared to bring your own power. And it's the, it's the thing that I always pack first and I put it at the bottom of my gig bag so that I know exactly where it is and it's never going to leave because that's not one of the cables that comes out regularly. So um, yeah, just make sure you have your power ready to rock. Um, the gaff tape as well and Velcro cable ties so that your power cables aren't going to trip you up once you get them all set up. Uh, and then for your PA, don't forget your power supply for that, which is typically an IEC cable, which oh, I meant to have a little one here. Do you have one? Anyone have one handy? Uh, <laughs> I, brought I can point it out in the next downstairs. picture. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I can point it out in the other one. I but it's right just, here, it's yeah. a cable that everybody knows and loves, but it's one that typically can fall through the cracks. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh oh. And IEC cables are great for a multitude of devices. They power sure wireless mics, sure in ears, I think, have that one. Um, PA speakers, powered speakers. I've used them on all kinds of things. So it's always good to bring a spare too, because you never know when they might get wonky after coiling them up. There you go. That's an IEC cable. This, this yes. is not near. There we are. So <laughs> perfect. There she blows. One thing okay. You forget. Yes. So don't off forget the TV in the bar, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure they'd appreciate. It. Well, then they'd all tune in to you, not the sports. But anyway, um, so for your PA, always also consider the stands that you need to bring. Um, I have a bag for my stands that includes the PA stands and my mic stand, so it's just all in one spot. Uh, and then also the cables for the PA, because a lot of times we think about our instruments and then we get there and we forget a way to connect our PA to the mixer and that is going to make you dead in the water. So cables for the PA. Then when you're thinking about the instruments and mic setup for the musicians themselves, make sure that you have power supplies and batteries. If you're using a wireless system, make sure the batteries are charged up. Um, if you're using a wireless system for your guitar, same thing. If you are using our GLXD system though, Justin wanted to point out a cool feature that we have, Justin. So let the people yeah, know. And that's with the uh, lithium ion rechargeable battery. That was one of the standout features of that system is that um, a full charge takes three hours, but if you charge it for 15 or 20 minutes, it should give you about an hour's worth of runtime. So that's sort of, you know, between sets or on the way to the gig in the car, you can plug it into the cigarette lighter in the car and charge it that way. Um, so yeah, just kind of a cool feature of that where, you know, last minute you can kind of charge it up and get by with it. Uh, although, like Laura said, we always recommend, you know, beforehand, you want to make sure you've got fresh batteries or your batteries are charged up all the way. Um, mm -hmm. If you think you have enough extras as far as batteries, bring more. That's my suggestion because it's never easy to find a nine volt when you need it. Go to Costco, um, get the bulk yes. pack when you're down to like <laughs> less than 10. Go back to Costco or <laughs> Sam's Club or wherever. <laughs> Get the big pack. <laughs> <laughs> Get the big pack. Yes. Um, I Yeah, I've also found Amazon Basics to be super helpful in the battery department, just in case anyone doesn't want to go to Costco, like I don't right now. Um, but also make sure that you have stands for your instruments. That's something that I always check. So when I'm getting ready to go to a gig, I think of each component. So I'm like, okay, mic, mic clip, mic stand, mic cable, you know, and then guitar, guitar stand, guitar cable, keyboard, et cetera. So like the stand is always in there and first and foremost, but it, it's in that checklist in my mind um, because yeah, you want to be able to set your guitar down when you get to the gig. You've invested a lot in the instrument. Let's not just lay it on the floor. Uh, and also for cables, um, always helps to bring extra cables. When we show you the picture of our gig rigs, I'll tell you that there's there's definitely some extras built in there because no matter how much you check them ahead of time, you can get to the gig and one can be a little faulty. And um, so it's just nice to have backups, sometimes new in the package, just so you're covered. Um, cases for your instruments, and of course, a tuner. And this would also be the part where we would put capo on there. Because, uh, yeah, again, I've done that several times. Um, and picks, if you're playing guitar. Maybe uh, a drink holder. Oh, yeah, I've always wanted one of those. I don't oh, have one too. of those. I always though. forget to get one. <laughs> yes, just those would be good. When you do a big dance um, move and you knock it, it's a problem. <laughs> Especially with ABBA sleeves, like the drippy sleeves. That exactly. Would be, that be it's disastrous. problematic. Disco capes, it's, yes. it's bad. <laughs> yes. Disco capes. That's hashtag goals. I need a band where I can wear a disco cape. Hmm. Too bad we don't live in the same city, Cheryl. It'd be really awesome. <laughs> um, also, what was I just going to say? I was going to think I thought of something else. 
Eh, I can't remember. Well, under the miscellaneous category, there's a ton more that we could put in here. Um, oh, music stand. That's what I was going to say. Uh, you know, if you are using music or if you're using an iPad, don't forget the clip to secure it to the stand. Um, and don't forget your music if you are using cheat sheets. Nothing worse than that. Um, so, yeah, make sure you have water. Uh, it, again, the fan, if you're going to be in a hot space, that's key. And you can look like Beyonce at the same time, which is an added bonus. Um, and merch. I don't know how many times you guys have done this, but I've gotten to the gig a number of times and been like, oh, my merch box is at home. And by merch, I'm talking like your CDs to sell, your stickers, your buttons, your T-shirts, whatever you're going to be selling, your disco capes. Um, you know, make sure that you have your merch because that's a nice way to make money and sucks when you forget it. Uh <laughs> And don't forget a way of capturing people who want to join your email list or, you know, have a way of letting people know what your socials are so that they can find you. And a towel. And Justin, this is not just for wiping off the sweat. What, why do people need to bring a towel? Oh, let's see. We discussed this. <laughs> what, what was it? Um... For wiping down your cables and your gear oh, at the end of the night, which so I had never picture. thought of. And you brought that up. I was like, that is brilliant because my cables get so schmutzy and I don't know what to do with them at the end. And it's brilliant. Yeah. You pick your cable up off of the uh, floor of the establishment where you're playing and you're going to coil it up carefully and then put it back in the bag with all the rest of your stuff it can help to yes. uh, bring a towel or I've played some outdoor gigs where I was at a, uh, a horse stable or pasture, <laughs> whatever it was. And there was a lot of dirt and dust that got on those cables. So, yeah, in that case, it's good to wipe them down and just kind of keep things clean. They don't tend to yes. break as much that way. I'll expand on that a little yeah. bit um, and say maybe in addition to a towel, something that's really good to keep is like a package of wet ones or um, Clorox wipes um, in your bag, uh, especially if you're using house mics. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using a house mic just for obvious current reasons um but yeah, you know bring bringing, bringing a bringing a wipe even to wipe down your own mic i know that i'm a mic eater so my grill is usually covered nice. with lipstick by the end of the night so i keep wet ones <laughs> in my bag to wipe it off and then you could also use it to clean off your cables as well so that's a good one yes so something i had never thought about so apparently i have really gross cables that i'm gonna wipe down <laughs> shortly after this webinar <laughs> so so that's just our checklist it's a starting point but you know, something handy to have just so you can keep it. It's not even long, just keep like a mental checklist. But I found that when I write it down or print it out, it's just helpful to keep that. And you know what we can maybe so, do is we can we can create a copy of that checklist and I'll include that in the follow up emails yeah. along with the 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 recording link. So we'll work on that oh, for you guys. Perfect. Fabulous. Okay, so you've created your gear checklist, you've gotten the gear, now you need to gather it all together. And I literally put it all out in one spot and take a look at it so I can physically put eyes on it and point to it and do my thing where I say, you know, guitar, stand, cable, all that. But you don't have to do that every time. Once you get the checklist in place and you have your awesome bin system like Cheryl or whatever you're going to do to manage it, it, you shouldn't have to lay it out every time. But it is nice to do it every few months to make sure everything's in the right order and working order and all that. So we talked about what you need to gather. So the power cords and power cables and batteries um, determine how many cables you're going to need and make sure they're all coiled up and ready to, ready to go and laid out and cleaned off. <laughs> and then um, grab your microphones and also make sure you have a clip for that microphone. I have been guilty of getting to the show and not having a clip for my mic, which when you're your own performer and there's nothing else there can be really interesting when you're rigging it up with tape and all sorts of things. But that was before I was with Shore. Now I'm a seasoned professional. Um, <laughs> And then for your instruments, again, just strings, instrument cases, picks if you need them, um, stands for that. So this is kind of the gather it all together so that it can then you lay it all out and it looks something like this. So this is my kind of singer-songwriter rig that I have. So I have my cable for my guitar, my cable for my keyboard. Can you see my mouse moving, by the way, on the slides? Yes, we can. Oh, yeah. Delightful. Okay, I'm like, yeah. All right. So <laughs> then this is for my vocals. And this goes into the PA because normally I use a vocal effects processor. But um, so actually, sorry, I lied for this setup. This is my vocal into the mixer. And then these are my monitor cables. Okay. So that goes out to the PA from 
my mixer, which is just a small little Mackie mixer, but it's worked very well for me for several hundred years. Um, and then, like I said, I have backup cables. So this is a new in the package, super long XLR cable um, for emergency use, strings, a MIDI cable for my keyboard, my mic and a clip and a pouch to protect it. It's my Beta 58 and power cable for the mixer, power cable for all the things and an extension cord, a very small one, but, and this is my suitcase that I've packaged it all up nicely in and then it rolls away on wheels and I'm good to go. And then Justin, this is yours over here. So tell us about yours. Yeah, you know, I saw your picture when I was uploading mine and I noticed the real theme <laughs> here with the power cable, the extension cord. Um, and I just kind of dumped out my bag and made it look nice, but um, <laughs> yeah, I've got, uh, I guess the thing I wanted to point out here is that this is sort of the uh, basic assortment of things. You know, so this is the stuff that always lives in that bag and it's ready to go whenever I need it. So I've got the mic clip, I've got several different audio adapters for whatever I might need to plug in, my gaffer's tape, the extra IEC cable, instrument cable, mic cable. And then from there, I can grab, you know, however many mic cables I need for the gig, whatever mics I need, and kind of throw that in there on top of it all. Mm -hmm. But um, this is important, too, because you have some not necessarily run-of-the-mill cables here, like especially this guy here converting XLR to quarter uh, and vice versa, it looks like. Actually, and then a, some RCA. A, yeah. um, let's see here. We've got stereo quarter inch down to a tip ring sleeve quarter inch there. Mm -hmm. And then the next one there is an RCA Y cable. Um, the quarter inch up at the corner there is a speaker adapter, sort of, on um, the other oh. corner. So it's a quarter oh, inch, yeah. and I've got a banana connector on the other end. So just kind of, you know, able to address many different situations. My speaker cable goes mm -hmm. down. The bass amp has a banana connector on it. I've got an adapter there. Nice. Um, and then these guys here. Cord. These are very important, having these little adapters, especially, like, even this eighth inch to quarter inch adapter I need this just for my keyboard um, so that it doesn't, because I have a Casio keyboard, so the external speakers don't work. I, I have to plug something in to turn those off, and sometimes I forget about that. So that's just a really quirky one, but those are ha very handy to have for a number of reasons. So just sort of, you know, be prepared, and, you know, if there's some kind of weird thing I have to plug in, sometimes I can kind of <laughs> band-aid something together and make it work for the gig, even though it's, you know, two or three or four adapters all in a row and don't look at it wrong because it'll, uh, you know, it's not the perfect solution, but, you know, it gets me out of a lot of sticky situations. Yeah, this one. What is this guy here? This that? is. So let's see here. We've got the, I guess from the left, it's a, uh, uh, so yeah, eighth from that inch. end, I've got a yeah eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter that goes out to RCAs, and I've got an <laughs> RCA cable. Um, what else? To what's a on the other side of that? It looks yeah, like a TRS. a TRS, right? So it's just a bunch of things I plug together so they stay in one place, <laughs> and I unplug what I need. But <laughs> so that's I perfect. Really use it in that configuration. I may have mm -hmm. actually used that to plug something into one channel on my PSM system from a you know from a stereo source. But yeah, oh, I did get stereo 3.5 down to a mono quarter inch in this case, the way it is right now. <laughs> it's pretty <Nice>. kludgy. <laughs> that is. But that were I mean, we've all been there before, like especially when I'm using this mixer. Sometimes I've gone in to plug in an aux track and I have to get into the RCAs and it's just kind of like, oh, I forgot that cable. So you have to bring the weird cables. You never know what's going to come at you. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to include those. Cheryl, what, do you have anything else to add to this? Because you didn't get to send us a picture of yours. I well, apologize. my picture would have been frightening because it's it's <laughs> there's so much going on. It's absolutely ridiculous. But <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, I'm a big fan, too, of in addition to labeling my cables uh, to make sure that they're mine. I also like to label them for what I'm using them for just to make setup easy um, so that I know, OK, I've got my computer cable. I've got my computer XLR for the computer out. I've got my click out XLR, and it just makes my setup a little bit easier and smoother and quicker too. So obviously you know what cables go where, but it just gives you that extra sort of way to check it off and make sure you've got everything streamlined. Nice. Cool. So now that you've packed everything up and you're making your way to the gig, what you have to think about before you even get there is to leave time for setup. Okay, so... How long does it take you? And you can time yourself in the setup. It's always going to go slightly awry when you actually get to the place. But I'm talking about leaving travel time, 
bake that in. A lot of times we forget about that. Um, and just make sure that you know how long it takes you to plug everything in so that you're ready to go. And if you're doing your own sound check, make sure you build in time to do that so that you're not doing it while the audience is there. You can avoid it. Granted, all the gigs I play are in vineyards and small venues where they're just sitting there like this and when you're setting up. But, you know, that's life and you make it a fun, all inclusive exercise and teamwork makes the dream work. Um, but uh, test your gear before you leave. We can't emphasize that enough. Make sure that it is ready to go and in working condition. And once you're at the gig, if you are playing in a venue that has a sound person, you want to be besties with that person. You want to know their name. You want to know what their favorite drink is. You want to know all the things because you're going to be asking this person to make you sound good. And if you don't befriend them from the beginning and you start getting up on stage demanding things, your gig is probably not going to go the way that you would like it to. So always remember that there is a person behind the, the console and you need to be kind to them so that they will be kind to you and make you sound your best. Of course, if you're your own sound person, you should probably treat yourself well too, but that rarely happens. But um, what else am I forgetting on that one? What do you think, guys? Did I leave anything off? <laughs> yeah, I think I think making friends with the sound man is a really, really important point. And, uh, and they also might pay more attention to your set rather than playing Candy Crush back there during the whole, yeah. the whole time. But um, I think one thing, you know, we keep talking about in-ears, you know, don't show up, you know, five minutes before you're supposed to be on stage and say, okay, where well, you, you keep plugging my in-ears because they're going to roll your eyes and maybe worse. Um, mm. And, you know, that's just the kind of thing that it does take some extra time to figure out, you know, what they're able to do. They need to set it up. They've got a lot of other things on their plates. So, um, you know, do that early and uh, you, know, you might have to get there way before you're supposed to play if you want that to happen. <laughs> I would also say yeah. if you're setting up your own PA and you think you need an hour, then leave two hours because something always yeah. happens. Or someone shows up and you're catching up and then all of a sudden you got to be on stage in 20 minutes and the PA is not live yet. So, yeah. Um, is just be prepared, leave time. And yeah, we really can't stress enough, you know, be cool to the sound person because, you know, <laughs> help each other out and everybody has a better time. Be and also, and know your gear too. I mean, that's the other thing that we forgot to mention a little earlier is that mm -hmm. let's say you're bringing like a vocal effects processor or some big guitar rig with a lot of, a lot of effects. You need to know the ins and outs of that. Uh, you need to know if your vocal effects processor is spitting out line level or mic level uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're not going to overload the PA right from the get go, because that there's no worse way or no better way to make the sound person really hate you than showing up with a mic effects processor and not knowing how to use it. So, you know, do your homework at home, plug it into your PA. And so when we set out the gear in the previous slides, you know, we're not really saying to set up your PA. And that's a really important thing. You know, you have the time maybe right now to do it. So set it up in the living room and, and make sure you know what those levels actually look like. Cool. Cheryl, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, just to reiterate, be flexible with the sound person too. Like, you know, it, because sometimes things, sometimes what you're running with might not work with what they're running with. And so, you know, if you have your IEM system and they just aren't comfortable making that work or helping you, then just be like, all right, I'll go with a wedge tonight. You know, it's not ideal, but sometimes it just makes life easier for everybody. And if they're happy and if they yes. haven't been, you know, dealing with your problems, like you said, they're going to make you sound better. Whereas if you're problematic and you're not friendly or flexible, they they aren't going to care what you sound like. So you're a team. You're working together. Yes. Yeah. So you've got to the gig, you've left time, you've set everything up, you've played a rocking gig, now you're ready to leave. And there's something to be said for teardown. Um, and a lot of times I think after the gig, you know, you're feeling like this and you're all like, yay, and this is what we think we look like and feel like at the end of the gig, you know, celebrating, having a drink. But this is actually kind High of five. what it feels like. <laughs> so, you know, you're having to deal with all this gear. What do you do with it? So, you know, you definitely want to, have a system in place for the back end of the gig for when you're going to be taking it home. So put things back where they came from. If you have that gig rig that's all situated and you have your checklist, use the checklist so that you're making sure that nothing gets left behind. Um, there's nothing worse than that getting home and you're an hour away and you realize I left my keyboard stand. Totally guilty of that. It took me a year to get it back. Um, wipe down all those cables and all your gear. Like Justin said, that's important to do that. Uh, and then Definitely, once you get home, make sure you're bringing it inside. Uh, don't 
leave it in the car, even though you feel like you're about to die because you're so tired from your incredible gig that you just performed. Uh, but definitely don't leave it outside, especially if you live in a city like Chicago, like Justin and Cheryl do. Uh, and plus, just from a damage perspective, um, you know, if it's hot or cold, extreme temperatures can damage gear, including electrical gear. So, um, yeah, bring it inside and make sure you're packing it down the same way you put it in. Yeah, I would just add to that, you know, once you're done playing, you're done with your set, you're on stage coiling up your cables, you're probably better off getting away, getting off the stage. You can do all that off to the side or backstage while the next band can sound check. And, you know, oh, yeah, that's important. Clear everything. And, you know, if you kind of go back to that last slide, you know, that's that's maybe what I would look like after the gig because <laughs> I gather everything and I'm trying to carry it all off stage at once and not trip over anything. But, <laughs> You know, you you should have some time afterwards, and you know, then you can go and have a drink and high five your band members, and you know, everything Yay! is everything is set and, and look like this. Oh, yeah, then you can look like that. <laughs> That's me. It's me at the end of the gig, right there. That's the singer who just unplugged their mic and walk off stage. Uh, yeah. right? <laughs> That's it. There's us, Cheryl. Ta-da! Hey, we have <laughs> gear. <laughs> we have some of us. So do. much gear. <laughs> so much gear. Cool. All right, so that's kind of what we wanted to talk at you about today. And now we want to talk with you and uh, and hear what kind of questions you have. So Cheryl, what do, we, what do we got? All right, so this first one is actually kind of a kindred spirit to me. It's not a question, but it's a comment. Um, uh, Rigid makes a line of toolboxes and organizers that clip together. Uh, they're just as durable as many name brand waterproof cases, but much more price friendly. I use the organizer mm. case for my mics, DI boxes, and small accessories. And the other thing I know about that system, because I've... I look at toolboxes because, you know, that's just something I do. Uh, we do. Yeah. <laughs> and rigid, they are. It's modular once again. So, like, you can pick, you know, oh, I just need the big one or I need – and they all kind of fit together and you can pick the sizes you need. Um, that's just one brand. Um, toolboxes, suitcases, like, there's all sorts of creative duffel bags, you know, just, just what works Caboodles. best for you. Caboodles. Caboodles. Hey, <laughs> which have made a comeback. I have one right yeah. behind me that I use for my There's stage no makeup. <laughs> yes, caboodles are the best. My girls have them. So yeah, there's just there's, a tackle box. There's no wrong. It is a tackle box. There's but really cuter. there's no wrong way to carry your gear. You know, whatever whatever works for you and gets it all there. Um, I think is a okay. Okay, so next question. Uh, where did the name IEC come from? Is it called anything else? Is that an acronym? Do you know? Uh, it it it's got to be, you know, it, it's yeah. electrical. Uh, one, something uh, electrical standby. current. <laughs> yeah. IEC acronym. Graded. Laura's on it. I am. It stands for International Electrotechnical. No, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. What does that stand for? There's several acronyms for IEC. I think it's wow. just the universal standard for, oh, here it is. No, that was, it's, yeah, International Electrotechnical Commission. But yeah. that's, no, that's a thing. <laughs> Man, we're well, you so... stumped us on that one. We don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> All right. Wow. Let's move on. Uh, next question is about batteries. Um, what batteries work okay. best? What batteries work worst? What should be used at all? And do you have any thoughts about rechargeable 9 volts? Ooh. Rechargeable nine volts are kind of tricky, um, yeah. Because some of them charge, you know, like if you if you got a meter and looked at a fresh nine volt battery, you'll probably read something like nine point three volts. That's for an alkaline battery. A rechargeable might only read eight point four volts, or it might read nine point six volts, and that could maybe not play nice with the device you're trying to power with it. Yeah. Um, so you have to be careful about that. You know, I think the rule is just test it out beforehand before you're trying to rely on it to get through, you know, four sets at a gig or something. The other <laughs> interesting thing about rechargeable batteries, um, you know, if you consider most of our wireless systems like the BLX, the SLX, you know, anything with the battery meter that just has three bars or four bars, those are calibrated to work with alkaline batteries, which discharge at a particular rate. So if it's got one bar left, maybe that's an hour left on the battery. A rechargeable battery might not behave the same way, so it might keep putting out the same voltage until it's five minutes from dropping entirely, and then you're done. Mm. Um, so again, you just want to test out any rechargeable battery you're going to you're going to use to um, kind of verify what your runtime could be expected to be. Um, 
and some rechargeable batteries, you know, compared to, you know, let's say if you're getting six to eight hours of runtime with an alkaline battery, maybe you're only getting two or three hours with a rechargeable, or maybe a rechargeable battery would give you 12 hours, you know, it just depends on the battery type and what the capacity of it is. So that's something that you, you know, if you had any specific questions on, you might send that to our support email address, um, sure.com slash contact. Some, something else I'll say about batteries, we're obviously focused more on, you know, what you're bringing to the gig. Um, something else that's equally as important to me is what I actually have on stage with me at the gig. Um, I have a little gig mm. stand and, you know, I have like lozenges and have some other, my water, you know, I have things that I definitely want. And one of the things I have is always spare batteries right there on stage with me because sometimes you forget or the worst happens and you have a battery failure and the best thing is to just have it right there so that if it happens, you just got them right in hand and you can change the batteries and not have to leave stage. So keep batteries run down the stairs. Exactly. Yeah. So Let's keep a pair green room. <laughs> on your stand in your pocket, have batteries on stage. If you're using anything with batteries, cause it's going to be much easier to just replace them on the fly on stage than leaving stage. Good point. All Usually right. when that happens, my tech just hands me the other guitar and I'm still okay. You know? Oh, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> My tech. <laughs> Hashtag goals. Sorry. <laughs> Heavens. All right. Uh, next, we got a series of questions about mixers. Any suggestions on small mixers to fit in a bag? And, and in addition to that, on any small Dante-based mixers and interfaces? And how about mixers that can be remote controlled via IP or mobile app? Oh, yeah. There's tons that's, yeah, out there. That's, a, that's yeah. a big can of worms. <laughs> I know. Oh, God. Uh I mean, do they want specific brands and names yeah. and models? You know, a mixer like the one in Laura's picture, it was the, was a six channel or eight channel Mackie. Yeah. You know, it's maybe six or seven inches square. They're easy to carry mm -hmm. around. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of ideal just to have something that's small and that's portable. Um, and, you know, there's Mackie, there's Behringer, there's Yamaha, you know, a lot of different brands out there that make mixers like this. You know, sometimes you can even mm -hmm. take your uh, USB interface and it's got a few mic inputs on it. That could be, you know, purposed as a mixer for a few input channels. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of these do have USB audio out. Um, I'm not familiar with any that have Dante output. I mean, Sure makes the SCM820 with Dante output, but that's not really something you would use for live sound production. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah that's not one i really have a good answer for um well there's several out there i mean there and now there's some like there's uh the yamaha ago3 i think and ag or ago6 which is a, a really great solution for um, people who want to do live streaming but also have a live mixer option because um, it has a usb out as well as an analog out and I am trying to find a picture of it um, so that you can see it. Yeah, I think that's one that comes into play a lot. You know, if you're streaming fitness instruction, or yoga videos, or anything like that, and you've got music you want to play along, that came up in one of the last webinars we did. Mm hmm. Hey, there he is. Yeah. So, I yeah, mean, so you should be able to see this guy here. And so it has, you know, a few channels in. It even has some onboard effects. So it kind of depends on what you're comfortable with using. Do you need effects? Do you need an aux in? Do you need the ability to go live? This is a good flexible option there, but otherwise you can just, you know, you can go with something like mine. Okay. Yeah. For my band, um, we use uh, the ever ubiquitous X32 for our in-ear mixes. Obviously, I'm a, nice. that's a nine-person band, so our needs for mixing and all of that are pretty – we run pretty pretty kind of self-contained for our in-ear monitors and give a split out to the front of house. So that's – and that's one of those apps that can be used to control via mobile apps so that we can all kind of control our own mixes, um, and it, it definitely works quite well for us. Um, and there are smaller versions of that, other brands that make versions of that. Um, the qu the, per the Querent um, further asked about Sure brands uh, – oh, no, Sure, brand names and models. Um, I think, you know, as we're not really a mixer company, we're more, you know, the front end of it. Um, there's so many great ones out there. And if you're looking for it, I would say there's lots of great blogs and forums out there um, or reach mm -hmm. out to a dealer. Um, uh, Sweetwater is a great dealer that has a lot of great information. I would say just, you know, reach out if you're looking for something new. There are lots of knowledgeable people that can help you make the best choice for for what you yes. what you need. Sweetwater, B&H Photo, Guitar Center, Sam Ash, 
Long and McQuaid, if you're in Canada, there's a ton. There's but, tons. You know, definitely yeah. go with our, our dealer partners because we love them. And they're and great. She says the gig rig pictures are still on the screen at the moment. Um, what's missing from mine, I actually took it out for the picture, but it also lives in that bag, and it's the Shure SCM268 mixer. So it gives you four mic inputs, one aux input, and it's just basic, and there's you know a volume knob for each input, master volume out, you're done. That's it. So Great mic priest, too. Time. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a good sounding mixer. So that's one that I use a lot just for, you know, a handful of inputs um, or you could even use it, you know, if they do have one mic input for you and you've got three things to plug in, that could be used as a sub mixer. So it's a pretty versatile unit, but I took it out because I just wanted the cables and the adapters for these purposes. Nice. Okay, next question. Um, any recommendations on Bluetooth to XLR output adapters or the reverse to carry in a bag? I think I'm going to start mm. by saying, and Justin, you can agree or disagree with me, but when it comes to Bluetooth for live sound, I would highly caution against using Bluetooth for live sound. Um, there's just too much inherent latency to make it a viable for monitoring or sending signal. It, it's You're just going to have too much latency, and it's going to make your life challenging on stage. Mm -hmm. Justin, yeah, you... about the only application I can think of is that, you know, if you do have backing tracks on your phone and you want to play those yeah. over Bluetooth, then, you know, it doesn't really matter if there's 20 milliseconds of latency because you're going to start playing along with the music. So no big deal. But mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, if you are looking for Bluetooth adapters, they're out there. If it's something that you're relying on for live performance, I wouldn't get the cheapest one that you can find because yeah. I've seen them anywhere from, you know, 15 or $20 all the way up to two or three hundred dollars. So, um you do know, the research. Do the research exactly, yeah. and you know, maybe, maybe uh, consider that to be an investment. You know, you wouldn't play on the least expensive guitar or the least expensive microphone necessarily. So, you know, right. put that in the same category. All right. Next question: Any suggestions on a mix of adapters to make an ISO or an ISO transformer or ground lift if you don't have the right one at the time, or have you run out, mm. or have you run out of what you need? Hmm. Oh, wow. To um, make your own ground lift transformer. Uh, I would not yeah, do that. Yeah, that's a good one. Because um, <laughs> I mean, there's a specialized ISO or, you know, or isolating transformer. Uh, yeah. A lot of direct boxes will have that feature where they have a ground lift right on them. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know of any way to make that using a bunch of adapters. That probably goes in the opposite direction because you know, you're putting a bunch of unbalanced adapters together. There's all kinds yeah. of potential for hum and noise to leak into that. So I'd probably yeah. stick with you know a good direct box that adds those features. Or um, a discrete power supply that is meant to counteract that. I think, uh, I want to say Hosa and Whirlwind might make something like that. I've seen them. And live wire. Maybe check those out. All right. Okay, next question. Oh, this is an easy one. Laura, what size lug luggage is that? <laughs> oh, that's the uh, the one that can go in the overhead. So the smallest one? Would that be like a 20 inch? A carry on size. Yeah. I think she has She's it. She's got it right there. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. All right. It's actually a really small one. It's not like the standard. That's why I stopped using it because like it couldn't hold anything <laughs> practical. Bad Plus, for travel, good for gig rigs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's heavy as heck too because it's a travel pro from like 15 years ago. All right, we've got a question about coiling cables. A popular, Ooh. a popular topic. Justin, do you want to talk a little bit about? He's looking around for a cable. I think we're going to get know. a live I demo. Have put all my cables away. <laughs> but um... I got mine. There yeah, we go. And maybe Laura can demonstrate, I can talk through it. But uh, the preferred way to coil a cable is over under. Yeah. And what that does is it's, it's basically the same thing as winding it up on a spool. So if you're going to do this thing, every time you turn it over your hand, you're also twisting the cable. So it ends up, you know, over time, it can damage the conductors inside the cable. If you do this right, um, what's really cool is that once you go over under, you can take the whole cable and just toss it out on the floor and it just spreads out and it lines up um yes although it usually happens for me is the the end the connector will go through the loop at least once and then i have a bunch oh of... no yes that's what <laughs> um, just happened to me when i uncoiled mine i was like oh that didn't happen when i did that but and then yeah you can see laura demonstrating the technique <laughs> over under <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i'm doing it right this is, this kind is how of, i do it this is kind of a kind of a joke but kind of not um feel free to practice over under because 
in terms of making friends with a sound engineer, um, knowing how to properly coil cables can go quite a ways. And if you if you're helping out at the end of the night and you start coiling an engineer's cables like, wrong, yeah. they're not going to be happy and they're going to redo it. So if you want to do that. Yes. So over under hey. um, it's it, once you get once you get the hang of it. And as long as the cable is not like horribly kinked up and messed up, because that also happens sometimes. It's a uh, it's it's a good skill to have. <laughs> yeah, the, the cables kind of get trained after a while. There you go. Yes. Perfect. Look at that. It's beautiful. And yeah, they'll and sort of they'll sort of get trained, and then makes it easier as you do it, you know, again and again. I was gonna say I can't find my little Velcro doofers, but normally I have these little Velcro guys that go here, and then you just slide them up and wrap them around. And you can buy a whole coil of those Velcro tapes um, that just tear off one at a time, so that you can have them. I wish I had one. Right I have hot pink ones to match my hot pink duct tape. <laughs> nice. nice. Ooh, you fancy. <laughs> I overdo everything. <laughs> All right. I next, don't know where it is. Next question. Um, and I'll I'll actually take this one. Does having a personal sound engineer help? Of course it does. Um, <laughs> yes, for uh, the larger band that I'm involved in, we we do have our own sound engineer who is at most of our gigs, and it helps out a lot. I mean, especially when you're when you're gigging a lot and and you have someone that knows your sound and knows your setup, um, and then they can help interface with um, the house people, you know, the house sound person um, and the the production people at the house. You know, they just they can act as a good liaison for you and just help make sure that you're going to sound the way you sound. It's not always obviously something that you can do, you know, and of course that's another person to pay and you should be paying that person. <laughs> uh, if they're worth their salt, yes. they'll, they'll be probably a little expensive, but um, it certainly helps. Uh, it helps a lot actually. So, but it's not always, you know, an option. So, but if you can, it's also go for it. A tip that I forgot to put in there, which if you're doing a solo gig, it can be really tricky to do a sound check. If you do invest in a looper that can loop your your vocals and your guitar and whatever you're plugging in there it can be really handy because then you can do a loop and then go out into the room and check your levels and then come back without having to make your audience participate in your sound check which can be fun but uh yeah so i use a vocal looper and that's a nice way of, of checking your sound that's really there's smart. an earlier question that came in about mixers that are controlled over ip or over wi-fi and that's yes, another yeah. cool feature of those that you know if you're able to, you can kind of go out in the house, like, you know, yes. like Laura said, you got your looper, so now you're hearing what you just played, and then you can go out and hear what it sounds like to the people at the bar or whatever. Um, yeah, like and then feature. control it. Yes, I do have a Mackie mixer, too, that has the iPad control, which is really slick. Um, a lot of mixers are going that way, too. The QSC touch mix, there's there's a lot. But, um, you know, having that option to be out in the crowd and mixing without being anchored to the mixer, if you're doing your own sound, is is really beneficial. And you're seeing a lot, I'm seeing a lot more of those in clubs and spaces. Like I'm seeing a lot mm -hmm. more of, of, you know, the house, house sound person going out to the middle of the room with the iPad and, you know, it's, it's, it is a nice handy tool. It's, it's been, yeah, it's been great. Uh, so speaking of the IEC, IEC cable, somebody also said an right. IEC is also called a D plug. So there's another name for oh. you. Um, Cause it looks like a D. Exactly. There you go. All right. Makes sense. You yeah. ever seen those Mickey Mouse ones where it has like the three circles and it kind of yes. literally looks like Mickey Mouse's profile? Not yes. profile, but... <laughs> All so, right. Uh... And then additionally to that, International Electrical Code, also known as UEC, Universal Electrical Cable, Tri-AC, though it's very incorrect, there thanks we go. Southern US, <laughs> as well <laughs> as Device Electric Cable as opposed to an extension cord. So didn't mean to trip anyone yeah. up or trick anyone. <laughs> Just noticed it was being <laughs> no, said a lot great. and pictured. <laughs> Yeah, that Absolutely. was great. And it's also because I know that IEC cables like uh, can be that same D connector on one side and then multiple plugs on the other, you know, so it is kind of a universal plug. So that's that's what I thought when you said the international Electra blah, blah, blah consortium or whatever that anyway. And speaking of cable names, <laughs> uh, XLR, where does XLR come from? Anybody? Justin, I'm guessing you might know that. A Canon XL with the rubber uh, jacket on it. And it was in a rubber jacket. Um, think about that. There is. Anyway, I know that the XL is from the Canon XL connector, and then the R has something to do with a rubber part that was on it, which I can't remember oh. if, it's the, if it's the strain relief or it was some sort of a rubber ring to kind of help this? the connector. I have to look that up, but that's off yeah. the cuff. 
All right. That's fine. Uh, next question. Back to batteries. Um, does Sure do any tests of batteries to see how they, long they last or how reliable they are? Duracell versus Energizer versus Clerk, Kirkland versus Rayovac, et cetera? I don't think we test um, yeah. oh. commercial batteries. Um, obviously, for some, many of our products, we make um, lithium ion rechargeable batteries, some which are integrated and some which are additional accessories. And we do do extensive testing of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of brands versus brands, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have the bandwidth yeah, to really test really, that. Yeah, I'd say you know the most popular ones are the Energizers, the Duracells, the Procells. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any good brand name battery should be pretty reliable. Um, you That's have to what watch I've found. Out sometimes, Just yeah, sometimes you have to testing. watch out for bulk <laughs> packages if they've been on the shelf for a long time. Um, what else? Yeah, as Cheryl pointed out, you know, our lithium ion batteries, we've tested those a lot. We finally retired the test after about, I don't know, four years worth of you know, just constant charge cycles. And we finally oh, wow. saw life go down to, you know, 60% or something like that. Those are on the uh, tech bulletins on Sure's website. If you look up batteries, you should be able to find it. Um, but that's under support and then find an answer. You can search for batteries. But we don't really have any, you know, specific brand recommendations, you know, kind of you know, use the ones that you find to be the most reliable, the most available, but you know, kind of stay away from like no-name brands. There's even counterfeit batteries out there you can find from time to time. So just kind of be cautious about that. But, yeah, I think with uh, batteries, you get what you pay for. Um, and something else I'll say about batteries, uh, a little trick that I use is that, um, and something we didn't talk about is always change your batteries right before the gig. Um I would say if you have enough battery from a previous a previous show or rehearsal, leave it in and then change it in between sound check and the show so you know you're on a fresh set of batteries. But then the thing that I like to do um, to, to try and conserve batteries is then if I've removed batteries, you know, the, the old batteries that you take out, if they're not quite dead, I save them and I use those for rehearsals. So I keep a box of batteries of of partially used batteries and just run them all out in a rehearsal. So that way I'm, I'm making sure that, you know, I'm maximizing my battery use. Um, another side note to that is, you know, I'd say if you want to save some money, have off-brand batteries, have those cheapo batteries for your rehearsals, once again. Because if your battery dies in the middle of rehearsal, it's not as big of a deal as it is in the middle of the show. Mm -hmm. And I keep a box. Very important. I have yeah. little, once again, over-organized Cheryl. I have little little plastic, you know, little cube boxes that I keep batteries in. And one of them has a sticker on it that says new. And one of them has a sticker on it that says used and so i keep i cycle so when i take out the partially used batteries i put them in the used one so i know then those are good to use for rehearsal so or sound checks or whatever so you know what we forgot in our gig you know our checklist uh we didn't put a sharpie in there you know a mat, a <gasps> oh marker. yes oh, fail point and then fail. you take out your batteries and put a mark on them and those are your rehearsal uh... batteries and you can write out the set list <laughs> with your sharpie Dang it. i did not think of that Keep multiple Very Sharpies. Important. Also, yeah. I saw yeah. I saw a funny meme going around because obviously Sharpies and, you know, music and, and audio production are kind of a easily stealable, coveted thing. Um, so I believe <laughs> I saw some meme floating around with some guy that had taken his black Sharpie and put like a hot pink lid on it. <laughs> and he oh. called it like a Sharpie stealing protection because nobody's going to steal the hot pink one. I mean, I would. Except but... you. Cheryl be like, oh, that's mine. What? What are yes. you doing? Yeah. Be like, we have my Sharpie mm -hmm. and then be disappointed that it's a black Sharpie underneath. But yes, Sharpies, Perfect. super important. All right. Um, and then just a comment. I'll second that for rechargeable batteries. It's not usually good to rely on the mic's battery meter. I use them for the educational AV I do and for personal use, but we are careful to know runtime and base our use off of that. I've had good luck with Ans Ansman Max E Pro and Panasonic Eneloop. So there's a couple mm -hmm. of suggestions. Yeah, those are actually two that I've recommended to customers before. Yeah, we've heard good things about those. Ansman and the uh, Ana Loop, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another one is iPower US. They make some pretty good lithium ion battery solutions. But yeah, the, the, uh, the, the takeaway is you got to test them first. And you got to know, is it going to last three hours or nine hours or what? Indeed. Mm -hmm. Um, another question about sort of, has anyone used the iPad? I think we kind of touched on this earlier. iPad based mixers like Mackie or rack remote unit, like the UI 24. Like I said, I use the X32. I think that's Behringer. Is that still Behringer or is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, we use the Behringer X32. It's, we have, um, 
we went ahead and got the one with the with the mixer, but they have versions that are just rack mount. If you have like a, a set of rack ears or something like that, <laughs> Justin's, yeah. <laughs> well, I would just add a comment on that. If you do have the rack mount X32, make sure that you bring the associated iPad. Otherwise, yes. you're plugging in and seeing which input will give you uh, audio output. And I got in that situation oh, all the time. Like, uh, nobody brought one. the power cable for that mixer. We can <laughs> no. use this one, but we don't know how it's configured. So we just got lucky and we found three input channels that came through the PA system. Oh, man. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. That's funny. Oh, okay. So certainly a lot of, so back to mixers, certainly lots of form recommendations and dealers out there, but what are your personal preferences for these devices? What would you use? So once again, like I said, we use the X32 in my band. Actually, we mm -hmm. use it in both of my bands. I, they each have their own X32s. Um, so that's worked well for us. But, you know, have you guys used any of those in your, in your personal music careers? Mm hmm. And this is my rig, so you're seeing what I'm using. <laughs> Laura is I've analog. Been plugged into a, I've been plugged yes. into an X32 many times, but I don't have one myself. They seem like great mixers, though. Uh, I well, and then, sure. yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Or yeah, the, the SCM268 or the 262, and those are just kind of workhorse, just real basic mixers that, you know, they're kind of lifesavers in a lot of cases. Otherwise, you can't go wrong with just, you know, the... The, the Behringer, the Yamaha, the Mackie, you know, just kind of the 16-channel yeah. mixers. The They're DL kind of series? Players. The Mackie DL series is the other one I have that has the iPad control, and that one's been really cool. Um, does way QS more than I ever make it do. <laughs> yeah. QSC makes a touch mix. That thing's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, one feature that I would look for, as cool as the iPad control is, and this kind of goes back to the point I made earlier about the rack mixer, um, I would prefer something that doesn't require the iPad, you know, so you have that feature if you need it, but then if you, you know, if something goes wrong or the iPad uh, fails for some reason, then you still have physical controls on that mixer. That would be really important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why we opted for the, the mid-range one that has the rack mount um, actual mixer on top. So it's a good backup. All right, uh, next question. Would you use an XLR to TRS adapter to a TS to XLR, XLR adapter if you were out of direct boxes and needed to ground lift something? Justin? Mm. <laughs> I, to try. You know, yeah, I know, I was going to say, it could work. It's not going to be pretty. It's probably going to be some, some noise in there. But I don't know, maybe. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, I would say give it a shot. Um, <laughs> At you know, home we first. take questions about yeah about hum problems. I mean, those can be notoriously difficult to track down. You know, yeah, you try different cables. Um, maybe it's just the power at the venue you happen to be playing. They've got a PA system that's not grounded correctly. You know, it could be a lot of different things. It's kind of hard to answer that definitively, but I think that's a really good, uh, um, you know, really good idea. You can certainly try it. I don't think you have anything to lose by doing that. Uh, do you have a recommendation for anything that you can bring to check for bad power or other AC or DC problems? Uh, just one of those outlet testers. I think you yeah. probably get it at the hardware store and it tells you if there's a ground fault or, you know, if the power, I guess maybe even, you know, I know some of the Furman rack power supplies, they have like a voltage meter. So you can see mm -hmm. if you're really low voltage or like really high voltage. But um, yeah, I've I've read that in a number of different places. You know, have one of those little. It's just like a little plug that you put into the outlet, and it'll tell you if uh, if things are bad or if things are okay. What you do about it from that point, I don't know, but it can help you. you know, maybe <laughs> no, don't plug your good amp into that. Maybe. Okay. Uh, next question: Would you bring a multi-track recording of a previous show to play into the PA through a DAW or other way to walk through the room instead of a looper? I think in terms of you know, making sure that your quote unquote sound is preserved. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I think that's not going to check what you're really wanting to check, which is the levels of the individual lines that you're sending. Um, right. If I'm wrong on that. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you, what you would be adjusting then would be the overall level of the mix, but not the independent channels. So if you're keeping all the settings from your last gig, the same, then that recording could be, a useful tool but um yeah it's it's really helpful to have something that can play exactly what you're hearing that night or day back 
Another suggestion of something we forgot along with Sharpies, guys. A dedicated flashlight or even a headlamp is another yes. great item to have, especially for setup and teardown. I totally didn't agree. put that on there only because we have our phones all have them. But yes, absolutely. 100% flashlight. Yeah. Got to love a flashlight. Yes. All righty. Yes. Uh, do you guys know of any good over under coiling tutorials or videos that you're a fan of? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. My dad taught me when I was, shoot, three, but he taught me to coil boat lines, not power cables and instrument cables. When I was it's young, a skill I've used ever since. When I was yeah. young, my parent, my mom was in a gospel band and my dad often ran sound from him. And it was not a good learning experience because we always did the worst thing, which is you take the cable and you put. <laughs> The one end in one hand, and then you just wrap it around your That's arm. What, yeah. Don't That's do that. That's what I showed as That's the cringe. wrong way Cringy. or the way to make your sound person hate you. But yeah, I'm doing slow motion now for those playing along. So here I'm holding. You go down the long end, bring it up, and then put it in your other hand. <laughs> no. So yeah, there's lots of videos. If you if you Google over under coil, I, and there's there's contests like... They had these crazy YouTube videos of like these guys that like they throw out a like a hundred foot XLR and then they coil it and they, they race to see who can coil the XLR. Oh, wow. It's hysterical. It's really funny. Like the, lum the lumberjack competition for sound engineers. Yeah, exactly. That's now cool. that I would go to see. <laughs> I would tune in. I would tune in. Yeah, totally. All right. So now we have... Um, some just sort of other off topic questions that I'll just present <laughs> since they're here and since we're here. Okay. Um, this one's kind of general, but uh, why not? What is stereo auto, audio and mono audio audio? I think that came in when I was talking about um, splitting a, a, a PSM system. Um, so can you guys talk mm -hmm. a little bit about stereo versus mono? I stink at explaining that. Justin, Justin you've got to take that one. Sure. I mean, I know what it is, but then I get all jumbled up. <laughs> Well, I think the easiest thing to uh, demonstrate stereo would be, you know, a pair of hi-fi speakers or a pair of headphones where, you know, you've got a separate left and right channel. And then, you know, let's say you're listening to a recording, you can hear, you know, the singer right in the middle, maybe the one guitar player is in the left and the other guitar player is in the right. So you're, you're actually assigning um, audio to different channels, um, you know, to kind of create that stereo image and it sounds natural. Uh, mono would be, you know, if you have a pair of headphones on, you're hearing the exact same thing in each headphone. So it kind of collapses in the middle. Um, and then uh, if you think about maybe like a guitar signal, that's that's typically going to be mono. I mean, I'm sure there's examples mm -hmm. of stereo guitar outputs, but you're just dealing with a single signal. Um, maybe a keyboard would be an example of a stereo output because you know, you've got some fancy synthesizer patch and there's <laughs> effect and chorus on that. I guess that's another example on the guitar. If you're going through effects, you may have stereo effects. So you hit a chord mm -hmm. and then the delay kind of bounces it back from the left and right channel. So that's where the stereo might come into play in the guitar example. Hopefully that answers the question. I think also with the uh, monitor mixes, um, a mono mix, you'd be hearing the same thing in each earbud. We don't recommend right. this, but sometimes people will listen you know, to one earbud and have the other ear open so you can hear the ambient sound in the room where you just end up having to turn up the monitors a lot louder in that case. So we, we usually recommend... <laughs> Negating like, the ear protection mm -hmm. benefit, yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that um, PSM transmitter has two input channels. So you can assign those as left and right and keep it in stereo. You know, if you have the ability to, you know, pan the one guitar player to the right, the other guitar player to the left, and, you know, kind of gives give some more space or, you know, create that stereo image for your mix... The other thing you can do is run both channels in mono, and as Cheryl said in the, in, you know, a lot earlier, um, that can allow you to, to send two separate mono mixes, um, you know, to two different packs, and you're just still going to be hearing the same sound in both earphones. The other mm -hmm. application of that, that we didn't really get to is mix mode. Let's say that channel one is your backing tracks, your click track, or the band mix, and then channel two is just you, the singer. Um, and that gives you the ability on the PSM pack to adjust the sound. So if I want to hear more of the band or if I want to hear more of me, I can kind of balance it to one or the other. So that's kind of a cool feature of that. That's a really mm -hmm. nice feature to use, too. If, you know, like you said, you can't have many channels or, you know, you're all kind of you don't have the opportunity to go from many mixes. You can you can set that up and, and be able to give at least everybody a little bit of control. So, yeah, dig it. 
All right. Um, then we have a question about cascading, um, cascading wireless. Can you cascade an IEM system, Justin? Um, so cascading, I guess they're probably talking about antenna distribution. So um, some so, yeah. of our wireless systems allow you to, you know, you connect a pair of antennas to the top receiver and then you cascade down to the next receiver. And some of them, you can do that with two units. Some others, you can do that with up to 10 units. Um, in your systems, um, we don't recommend doing that. Um, you know, like one thing you could do is use a passive splitter and combine the antennas for two uh, wireless mm -hmm. transmitters. Um, but you end up um, reducing the output power significantly. So what I would recommend for that is using a dedicated uh, antenna combiner. And it'll handle the power output of those units and um, it would just avoid a lot of headaches uh, with some problems you can run into with wireless systems, intermodulations and other things that it would just either degrade the signal or add a lot of artifacts to it. So. Yeah, the best thing you can do is use a dedicated antenna combiner rather than trying to cascade or try to use, you know, the T connectors and plug a bunch of things together. Mm -hmm. You usually end up running into a lot of problems that way. Right. All right. I got another question. Uh, stereo feed to the PA or just dual mono? And how about surround or at least LCR? LCR. I think left, center, right. Left, center, oh, right. Oh, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, it depends on the PA system. I would say mostly what I'm familiar with, even at some like larger venues, they just have a mono PA system. They don't have the ability to spread things out from stereo from left to right and mm -hmm. so loud that it doesn't really matter anyway. It just fills the room with sound. Um, you know, the mixer in, in the picture on the screen, Laura's mixer, it looks like it's a stereo mixer. So if you have two, two PA speakers, mm -hmm. um, you know, you probably can pan, you know, the vocalist to the left channel, the other vocalist to the right channel. Um, so uh, I guess the answer is, you know, it just depends. It depends on where you're playing and what the capabilities of the sound system are. Um, but the other thing, too, to consider is that, you know, if you're panning one guitar player all the way to the left, can the people on the other end of the room hear that guitar player? Yeah. You know, the PA yeah, exactly. system is ideally it's going to throw sound over the entire room and everybody can hear all the performers no matter where they're standing so that's something else where you know if you are going to mix in stereo you probably want to walk around the room with your ipad and make sure everything is being heard correctly nice all right well i think we got through all of our questions so um we want to thank you all for joining us and uh thanks for, to laura and justin you guys have any final thoughts about about rigs and i know i have to complete i Gonna have to completely rehaul mine before I go back out. <laughs> no, I think this again, just kind of a starting point and for you guys to use to jump off on, but and from rather, but uh, it was just fun to talk with everybody and, and get some different ideas for what to do. So, you know, there's plenty of resources out there, uh, but this was just kind of a fun little thing for us to talk to you about today. So, thanks for being here and thanks for listening. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for listening. It was a lot of fun to talk about all that, and we could talk about it and tell stories all day. But you know, we just try to, <laughs> you know, get get you thinking about this stuff and um, give some examples and not try to get too technical or anything. But like Laura said, there's a ton of resources out there, you know, for live sound. Um, you know, read if you if you do get a mixer, you know, spend some time reading the manual because a lot of times yeah. you'll find some things that you, know, you may not even have thought about before that are really cool features on that product. So. You can learn a lot that way. You can learn a lot from YouTube videos, uh, maybe even chat up the sound guy, you know, ask him what he's using. Um, you know, just get a look at that stuff and kind of uh, just, just dive in and uh, have a lot of fun. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. And